I lift my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Good morning and welcome to Ferndale Community Church on this first Sunday of February, February 7th. Also happens to be Super Bowl Sunday. And uh, because it's on video, you can watch it at any time. I just pray that you would uh, like and watch this video and also uh, enjoy the Super Bowl today. We're still not meeting in person, so this is a recorded message for you. And uh, first thing this morning I want to do is read the call to worship. The message today, which I will be giving later, uh, talks about grace. So I thought that this uh, reading from Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10 would fit that uh, theme of grace. And it says, as you, excuse me, it says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were nat nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. A reminder of where grace comes from. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father God, you are so mighty in your works. We see your works all the time in, in this world, in the stars and the sky. We know that you live outside of space and time and that you're out there controlling the universe, planting the stars in places where you want them, making the galaxies spin. And at the same time, you are in us, in our lives, through your Holy Spirit. You watch over us every day you are constantly in touch with us. You love us, Lord, with your grace and your mercy, and we are so grateful for that. Lord, we confess at times that we don't do what we should do. We know that the things that we need to do, but we put them off, we procrastinate because they're difficult. And sometimes we do things that we shouldn't do because of our nature. Lord, we confess that now and ask for your forgiveness. Lord, I also want to pray today for <clears throat> people that are suffering, for those that uh, have the virus, who are suffering at home or in the hospital, for the families of those that have passed away, the ones that uh, did not survive this terrible plague that we have going on. I pray, Lord, you'd be with them. Have someone there around them to comfort them, someone to come alongside and listen to them when they're grief, grieving. Lord, I also want to pray for people in the church, for our church family and friends who are ill, who are suffering sickness or, or have surgeries coming up or, or uh, ill at, at, in, in their feelings, their emotions, or are lonely, or spiritually down, whatever it might be, Lord, I just pray you would give them peace and comfort. Help us to know how we can help them and make them not afraid to reach out when they need help. Lord, we are so grateful for all you do for us. We know, we see it every day in our lives. We see small miracles happening all over the place. We're grateful for the vaccines that are out for this virus. We're grateful for the fact that the cases are starting to drop a little bit. Lord, continue to be with us, please. And Lord, I also want to thank you so much for your salvation plan, because we are sinful by nature. None of us are without sin. The fact that your plan required Jesus to come, 
teach us how we should be, tell us about your grace and mercy, and at the same time, at the end of his life, give up his life on a cross for us, taking on all of our sins, past, present, and those future sins that we will perform. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to worship you. And I pray all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now this morning we're going to celebrate communion, a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us. The scripture for communion this morning comes from uh, John 6, verses 48 through 58. And he talks about what Jesus is in being the bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that come down, came down from heaven. If a man eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up that last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Our forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Words from our Lord Jesus Christ as he explained to his disciples the meaning of celebrating his life, his death on the cross, by remembering what he did for us. Now this morning I have this little communion cup that we've been using during the pandemic, during the COVID pandemic, and uh, I'm going to use this, and, and at home you can Get some crackers or some juice of some kind, and if you want to pause the video now, you can pause it and, and uh, get that ready. And we will pray over the bread and take the bread together and drink of the cup too. Father God, we just want to come before you now as we get ready to remember the sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross remember the great thing that he did for us, taking on our sins, separating himself from you temporarily, but in that terrible moment when he took on our sins and he could not be with you. We can't imagine what that must have been like for him, Father. We are just so grateful for this time. We're grateful for the body of Christ. We're grateful for what he has done for us. Now on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Let's do this together. Let's pray over the, the Jews. Father God, this juice that we're drinking represents the blood that was shed for us. Jesus did this act in, in abeyance to your will. He struggled with it a little bit, Father, but he eventually gave in, knowing that you had a perfect plan for us. And he was willing to die for us, to shed his blood for us, even though we sinned against him. And on the cross he asked for forgiveness for those that were killing him. It's hard for us to understand, Father, sometimes this great sacrifice, but we know that it was part of your plan for us that we can come to you now and directly pray to you and talk to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. On that same night as he was betrayed, Jesus took the cup and when he blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, 
This is the new covenant in my blood shed for you. Let's take the cup together. Now let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not going to sing the doxology, but let's just say it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him up above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now, the message, where is the grace? Some years ago, there was a TV commercial about hamburgers. I forgot who the commercial was for. It's been many years ago. Some of you will remember it. Uh, some of you weren't even born yet. But there was a little old lady that went up to the counter and had a hamburger there with a <clears throat> big bun and a little tiny piece of meat in the middle. And she was kind of upset and she said, where's the beef? And I thought about that when I was praying about this message today. And I titled it, Where's the Grace? Because it turns out that grace is missing in our world today. It's in short supply. So, today I want to talk about what grace is, how it's defined, and what's happened to grace in the world. Let's open in prayer. Father God, I pray that you would use me as a hollow tube, use me as a hollow reed for your word, for your message to reach out into the world. Help me, take me out of this, Father, take my ego out of this, Take me out of this and let it be from you. And as usual, I pray, Lord, fill my mouth with worthwhile stuff and stop me when I've said enough. In Jesus' name, amen. How do we define grace? Grace is the unmerited favor of God. It's freely given. There's no charge, no payment, nothing we have to do. It's interesting, too, because of all the religions in the world, Christianity is the only one that does not require us to do something to earn the grace of God, to earn merit with Him. Every other religion requires people to do something with their life, to earn that grace, to earn that favor with God. We don't have to. Our God gives us grace and mercy and favor without uh, restrictions unconditionally. And that's a wonderful thing, and I'll tell you why that works so well. It's because when we deal with people around us, with our neighbors, we learn uh, through, through the faith, through our faith, the way grace is given, and we can give it to them in the same way. Those other religions, I think you'd have to earn that grace with that person. So, that's the good news. That grace is unmerited favor of God, freely given, and cannot be earned. Now for the bad news. The bad news is the Christian faith is not the fastest growing religion in the world today. I'm not going to go into that. You can look it up online and figure out what is going on, but, but that's a problem. And I'll tell you why. We'll get into that in a little bit. <clears throat> it actually appears that we've been going backward in the last few years. The Barna Group is a research group that uh, researches information on church for churches and gives them that information. And uh, they did a study in 1996, and they asked people who didn't go to church, what are your views on Christians? How do you feel about Christians? And 85% were favorable. They said, yeah, they're good people. Christians are good. They do good works. 2009, the same research was done again, asking unchurched people, non-believers, 
That was 13 years later. That 85% dropped to 16%. Evangelicals came across as 3%. So what happened? Something took place in that 13 years that changed the view of people out there in the world about Christians. Now that bothers me because if I'm out in the community and I'm talking to someone who doesn't go to church, who doesn't have a faith, and I try to explain the gospel, the good news of Jesus to them, they're not going to want to listen. The barrier is going to go up. How can I follow Jesus' command to carry his word, his grace, his truth to the world if people close their ears and don't hear? It's, it's a problem. The study also asked people how they saw Christians. And a lot of them saw Christians as the moral police. We were like policemen going around checking their morals. They asked how they felt about uh, evangelicals. And some of the people said, well, if you're a Christian, you must hate gay people. Some of the comments they made about Christians came across words like illiterate, greedy, psychos, racist, stupid, narrow-minded, bigots, idiots, fanatics, nutcases, screaming loons, delusional simpletons, pompous, morons, cruel, nitwits, and freaks. And that's just part of the list. Not very good press out there on Christians. Some people didn't even know what evangelicals did or how they believed or anything else. They just knew they didn't like them. And I think part of that problem is that sometime in the six, and I'm sorry, sometimes in the 90s, the evangelical word was, was hijacked. And it became used by a certain political party. And if you weren't part of that party, you weren't a believer. You weren't faithful. And that's too bad, because it's a beautiful word. It just means sharing the good news. And I think the word evangelical is great. I'm just sorry that it has such a bad connotation today. Mahatma Gandhi once said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. That's kind of bad press right there. Uh, I recently read a book by the Christian author Philip Yancey, and it was called Vanishing Grace. My brother-in-law read it and told my wife about it, and she mentioned it to me, and I thought, well, it'd be interesting. I'd like to read about this and see, what is he saying? And some of this information I got from that book, and I'm reading it now for the second time. He has the bad news in there, but he also has, toward the end, some good news. Because not every Christian in the world is looked down upon or looked with the same sort of disfavor as they're finding today. A lot of Christians in foreign countries are looked upon by the people there as good people because they're doing things like teaching, they're doctors, they're helping out in the community, they're giving. They're not taking, they're giving. Now why has this happened? Why is the, the views out there in the public eye of the non-believers the way it is about Christians? Well, Yancey talks in the book about <clears throat> a couple of different Christians. He talks about pre convict pre-Christians and post-Christians. The pre-Christians are ones who don't know anything about the faith, hadn't heard about it, a little more open to it. The post-Christians, unfortunately, were those people who were injured terribly by the church they were in. They were emotionally hurt. Uh, some of them suffered uh, abuse in certain ways. But those are the people that turned from the faith and turned away. Those people were less likely to want to come back and hear the message again. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that God has entrusted flawed human beings with spreading a perfect message of faith and of love. A lot of people feel that Christians are judging them. Some are condemning them for their lifestyle choices and even for their political views. Few people get judged for other reasons, different reasons, but the ones that don't get judged, that are loved, are respond better to what the message is. 
They're loved and not judged. So we need to stop judging the world. That's God's job. It's not ours. We can look at the world, we can see what ha what's happening, we know what's going on, but our job is to spread that grace that God has given us, to share that grace with other people. He didn't give us, he didn't give us grace for no reason. And Jesus told us why. He told us to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. So our job is to get out there and love our neighbor and love those people that we don't agree with and love the ones who, who we want to, are tempted to judge. As I said, that's not our job. That's God's job. I had a friend who was a priest one time who said that God didn't go on vacation and appoint him judge. He said he was good at it. He's very good at it. But it wasn't his job and it's not ours. So we need to concentrate on loving people. Christians are also seen as heavy-handed. You know, sometimes you come up with them and hit them over the head with the Bible. We don't have to do that. We have to hit them over the head with love. It's much softer and works a lot better. They say that Christians are condescending when they're speaking to non-Christians. They are acting like they're holier than thou. We're all sinners. Even those of us that accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we still sin. So the holier than thou thing doesn't work and all it does is turn people off. A lot of times it's more about the agenda of the church than it is about the good news of the gospel. Churches jump onto an agenda like they're anti this or anti that or anti something else and all of a sudden that becomes their primary message. And so the people out in the world see it and they say, oh well they're just against everything. That's not who we are. We should be for everything. We should be for things that God tells us to be for. Things like love and caring. And you know there's a balance between truth and grace. Grace and truth. Jesus had that perfect balance. He knew how to balance that exactly. He knew the grace and truth. We have to learn that. First with grace and then truth told with grace and love. Sometimes we have a tendency to try to make ourselves right by making others wrong. That doesn't work. It brings us down too. The other thing is that anybody out there can call themselves Christian. There's a great song I love called They'll Know We're Christians by Our Love. People can say, well, I'm a Christian. There's no test they have to take. But actions speak louder than words. You can talk all you want, but what you do is what makes a difference. So what do we, what do we most long for as human beings? What are the things that we look for? One of the things is a sense that our lives matter to the world. They were here for a purpose. It's not just a random thing. And we're not just sitting around doing nothing, waiting to die. That our lives are meaningful. And we all want a sense of belonging or being loved. A sense of belonging to the community. And how do we get that sense of being loved? First of all, by loving others. And it, what goes around comes around. So what can we do? Well, one of the things we can do is don't worry about converting people. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. We can carry the message through our actions. But it's not our job to go out there and convert and make people. And if we come to them at, with that high angle, with that idea in mind, they will sense it right away and they will turn away. They will shut us off. We're not about converting people. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. We can start acting with grace and start caring about people. Some of the most important people to the faith are those that are out in the, in the community, out in the trenches, the people that are at the rescue mission, helping people and sharing the good news. People at food banks, people at clothing banks, centers, People that are in the trenches doing things, those are the heroes. Our job is to be a better messenger. We're flawed, but the message is perfect. And we need to start treating others the way we want to be treated. 
So some of the things that we can do are to remember certain things when dealing with people. One of the things that words are important. We need to be kind and gentle in what we say and how we say it. Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And anger does not help anything. It only divides us further. We can look for opportunities and needs. Simple actions of kindness. To do a kind act for someone. Romans 12, 10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor and showing love. We can be grateful with other people. We can keep calm and respond with grace when others are rude and harsh. Hold our tempers in check. It's so easy to lose our temper. It's such a, a, a flesh thing. It's such a worldly thing. It's something we have to work on. It's not easy to do. And we can be there for people. Sometimes people just need our presence. I've been in situations where I prayed for people that are leaving this earth getting ready to go home to God. And their loved ones are sitting around and sometimes they don't need to hear our words, they don't need to hear anything other than the prayer, they just need to know we're there for them. We don't have to say much at all. We, can, we don't have to say, I know how you feel. People use that, well, I know how you feel. We don't know how they feel. So we shouldn't say it. We can say something like, it must be very hard for you for what you're going through right now. Let them know we understand. Let them know that we have empathy and compassion for their situation. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. We can forgive. When you forgive someone, you do it without correcting them. You don't have to offer any explanation why you're free. Just forgive them. Matthew 6, 14, 15 after Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, the Lord's Prayer, he said, For if you forgive others your tres their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do, do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We can ask others for forgiveness when we've slighted them, when we've done something to injure them, to wound them. Apologize quickly when we've hurt someone by our words or our deeds. Matthew 5, 23, 24 says, So if you're offering your gift to the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother, then come back and give your gift. Get straight with your brother, get straight with the person that you've wounded, and then come back and give your gift to God. We can be careful how we speak to others. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up, as it fits the occasion, so that you may give grace to those who hear. Giving grace. No corrupt talk. Be careful what we say. We can be grateful to others. Say thank you and let others know how much we appreciate them. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says. This does not mean just giving thanks to God, but thanking others. Showing how important they are. Minor things. And it doesn't cost a dime. Just to be grateful. Show an interest in other people. Ask them about their lives. Listen and care about them. Paul in Philippians 2.3 tells us, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Being humble. You know, you know, admitting that we don't know it all, but we have lots to learn. Grace is the love of God shown to the unlovely, the peace of God shown to the restless, and the unmerited favor of God. And since he has given us grace, as I said, we need to pass that grace on. What else can we do? We can do even more than that. We can be more like Jesus. We can love more and judge less. We can stop putting people down. Instead, encourage others. Lift them up. Lift them up by your words. We can live our faith. We can walk our faith. 
not expecting anything else in return for it. We can just be who God wants us to be. And as I said before, don't try to make converts of people. Simply love them. And by your actions and by what you do, they will want to know more about you. Why is it that you are the way you are? What hope is there for the future? Well, the answer is in the greatest commandment. Love God and love your neighbor. Concentrate on the message, not the messenger. See, Jesus was the perfect messenger. He didn't have any sin. He was sent from God to do a job, and he did it. And we can be more like him. We need to be better messengers. Whenever we interact with others, we have an opportunity to dispense grace at that time. We can present God to them with grace and with love. John in chapter 7, verse 38 says, Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Rivers of living water. And that's love. Love will flow from us when we treat others in the right way. It, throw, it actually flows through us, not from us, because it does come from God. We were loved first, and we have the privilege now of sharing that love with others. The living water is the Holy Spirit, and when we share the message of the good news and the gospel, it will reach other people. Since God is love, the Holy Spirit is part of God, so it's love also. You know, we can share the word in a, in a very simple way, in a humble way, we can have empathy, we can have compassion. We need to accelerate our walk and humble our talk. It's a very simple thing to remember. Accelerate our walk with the Lord and humble how we talk. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your words today. Thank you for your message of hope in a world that is plagued by different problems and difficulties for, uh, in a world that has uh, far too much judgment and not enough love. Help us to remember these words. Help us to remember to treat people the way we want to be treated. And it's so easy to do. Love does not cost us anything, and the more we give, the, the more we will get. Now, appreciate, Lord, everything that you've told me on this, and I just pray that it will go out in the world today and to be with those that are watching this message. Help them to open their hearts and minds to this and, and help us to be better Christians. Help us to better share the good news. We pray this in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a wonderful week and walk the walk.